be mobile somewhere where you're not directly in competition with my business. A sustainable community. I've a always community. thought that brick and mortar was the ultimate goal. Food trucks create more walking traffic, more excitement. In and our goal is to conduct a community conversation and to help people learn about the benefits of backyard hens. Our goal is to conduct a community conversation and to help people learn about the benefits of backyard hens. A sustainable community is a strong community. If we want to start changing zoning rules, my experience on the Planning Commission is that's like pickup sticks. We should have some knowledge of where our food comes from and be able to control that as much as possible. task force has uh, several missions. One of them is to survey what the available food sources are now, um, to look at what the needs are for food, what the uh, issues are around food insecurity, um, and to look at possible solutions it, to any of the problems that we are able to identify. Well, I think there are sort of three classes of advantages. There's health, primarily nutrition. You can raise much healthier eggs if you feed the hens good, healthy food. Um, there are environmental benefits. Um, instead of all the pollution that comes from, um, from large-scale factory farming, you can the, 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 the hens produce a very small amount of waste that can be easily composted or you know, used as fertilizer in gardens. There are educational benefits. Um, it gives us uh, knowledge of where our food comes from and how we can change the food that we eat. And that's great not only for adults, but also for kids. It has a task force on urban agriculture, and that task force is looking for options to um, uh, revise the current ordinance in Arlington so that residents can keep small numbers of backyard hens. A group of us got together a couple of years ago and thought that we should follow the lead of other communities that have embraced urban agriculture and backyard hens, and so we formed the Arlington Egg Project to advocate for allowing residents to keep small numbers of hens here in Arlington. The other Civic Association, former Civic, Civic Association presidents, um, approached me and said, Jim, this is the worst idea I've ever heard of. Would you please help? And I said, yeah, it's one of those things that I, strikes me as not such a good idea when you look at it. So I said, yeah, I'll try. It's not necessary. It's really not necessary. Uh, if you look at the trade-offs of noise, uh, and there's going to be noise, you look at dealing with the excrement, uh, is a nice word for it, plus all the other refuse that goes with it. Um, the impact on neighbors, because you can't do anything in these little 5,000 square foot lots that we live on without affecting the people that live around you. Uh, and we're doing this because we want better tasting eggs or we want people to, to know about chickens. It, it just doesn't, doesn't meet the criteria for going to all that trouble. to determine whether there's a factual basis um, for some of the concerns of the people who are opposed to it. Um, they have valid concerns. They're concerned about health issues that might be um, posed uh, by these hens. They're worried about pollution of the Chesapeake. Um, they're worried about any impact to their, their real estate values, to their homes. Um, they're worried about nuisance um, and infectious disease. Now, the, none of those concerns can be taken lightly. Um, those are some pretty serious concerns. The chickens do okay with salmonella. It's in their gut, it's in their intestines, it's on the eggs, and it's in the excrement. So, you know, and they've already warned, seniors and children should not handle the chickens, the eggs, or get anywhere of the excrement. We do know that when you bring raw chicken into the house, 75% about 
has to be, will be determined to be contaminated with salmonella. So we know that when we teach people good home hygiene, raw meat, particularly chicken, is a problem and and every household needs to be educated about handling raw chicken. You, you have the responsibility to make sure that you're cleaning the coop and make sure that you're disposing of the waste and composting it or, or somehow disposing of it in a way that's, that's, um, that's appropriate. And um, again, but since, it's, since it is sort of an expensive venture and it does require some effort and some cost on the part of those doing it, I think that the people who will choose to have hands in their backyard should the Arlington County Board make that legal will be the types of people who are responsible enough to keep their coops clean. You know, and I, I think that the way that chickens ought to be managed is similar to the way dogs are managed and that if they're not a nuisance then you should be able to have them. You know, if, if you don't pick up after your dog then you get fined. If you don't clean up after your chickens you should get fined. There's an awful lot of work that's involved with this and I don't think the people that are getting involved in it realize that. Not only that but um, what it does to your yard is really something to behold because if you leave the chickens there, they will pick every bit of vegetation right off the ground uh, and you'll wind up with um, refuse soaked into it uh, or floating downstream to your neighbor's house. So factory farming is, there can be literally millions of hens in a very small area. So there's no way that that amount of land can absorb that amount of waste. So there's an incredible amount of waste that has to be disposed of some way. Often that waste gets washed into streams which flow into rivers, which flow into the Chesapeake Bay or the oceans um, and become a huge uh, sanitation issue and a huge environment issue. Backyard hens, a small, if you have a small number of hens in a lot, even the size of most Arlington backyards, that lot is big enough to absorb the waste of that. It's a very small amount of waste compared even to having one dog. A lot of people here really care about the Chesapeake. Um, the question of whether or not, um, what amount of hens will it take to negatively impact the um, Chesapeake? Really important questions. We know that upstream on the Chesapeake, Industrial chicken farming has negatively impacted the Chesapeake is one of the single biggest reasons that um, the Chesapeake Bay is unhealthy. Mm, will backyard hens uh, add to that? We need to find that out. I think if you've got the required amount of land, uh, that's fine. But we live in an urban environment. Uh, we already have enough problems with dogs, and dogs make great pets. I have one, but if we're going to add chickens to this, and then we add pigeons, well, and, and it says poultry, so ducks and geese, uh, and, and you know, when you look for what you call boundary conditions, where's the edge of this, where, how far can this go? I don't see the edge of all the problems and all the different things that can, can come out of this. Um, I think it's also important to remember that uh, there's also the consideration of the humane treatment of any animal, be it dogs or cats, rabbits, anything that people might keep as a pet. Um, hens are flock animals. Usually you don't have one hen. Usually you usually want two or three. But they need a certain amount of room to be humanely kept. And, and people are really concerned about that, where there's industrial hen farming, where they're cramped into cages. So nobody wants to replicate that. We're talking very small numbers, and there are people who have studied, you know, what is an appropriate amount of land to have per chicken. And I, at this point, am under the impression with the land uh, available in most people's backyard here, we're talking pretty small numbers. Uh, you take a 5,000 square foot lot, use a 60 foot frontage, which is the minimum required, and eight and 10 foot side lots, uh, you wind up with about a 43 foot back end, uh, 60 feet across, and then if you do what Baltimore has with a 25 foot setback, you wind up with an area where you can have your chickens about a foot wide and 10 feet long on the back side of the house, uh, which I wouldn't want to put a chicken in.
last two years, 500 communities in the United States that have legalized backyard hens. And I think that's a very important point. And Arlington, I know, wants to think of itself as a progressive city. And um, uh, I think that it's important that Arlington look to these other communities and learn from their examples, learn from what, learn from their process, how they did this, what the result has been. If people want to have a small backyard flock, you know, three, four chickens, I think that's perfectly reasonable. Uh, you know, they said before, they don't make noise, they don't smell, they don't cause problems. Um, if anything, they can help. I need some help with my garden, and backyard hens would help me with my garden. They're good composters. They eat bugs and they eat weeds, and they produce food. So um, those are some of the benefits that I'd like to realize as a backyard hen keeper. For me, it's also important to help my kids and also help uh, my wife and me to learn more about where food comes from. We think it's important to eat healthful food and our backyard hens, if we are allowed to keep them at some point, uh, will be a part of that. I've tasted the difference between fresh eggs and even upscale grocery store eggs and there's a huge difference. Well, the biggest disadvantage I think is that it's not the cheapest way to get eggs. If you want cheap eggs um, and easy eggs, then you can walk down to the grocery store and get some eggs. You can get organic eggs there, you can get eggs that are healthier than the cheapest eggs. Um, and it's still gonna be more cost effective, I think, than raising your own hens. So this is about families being able to make choices. And just like some people choose to keep a garden in their backyard and raise some of their own food, so it is that if hens are legal, um, as they are in many other communities, some Arlington families will choose to do that. This is, you know, a couple of chickens in a backyard. Um, so it's, a, it's really a very different um, dynamic, I think, than, than maybe what people understand. I think there are so many other priorities that we need to spend our time looking at uh, affordable housing, transportation, uh, the time it took me to park when I came down here for this interview, uh, and we've got all this time we're spending on chickens. When you have livestock, um, it means that there's part of it that's going to be edible, or it's part of food production. Now the eggs will definitely be part of food production. One of the things that needs to be answered is uh, hens don't lay eggs their entire life. So what happens when they stop laying eggs? Um, if people only have two hens, personally I suspect they'll be pets, um, and they'll probably have names, and in all likelihood will not be used for the dinner table. But not everybody will see it that way. We're very progressive when it comes to things like trying to make sure that our, um, our contribution to protecting and preserving the natural world is as good as any communities. And I think embracing backyard hens is going to be part of that. It's going to be very much in the tradition of, of Arlington's strong neighborhoods, strong community, and environmental protection. I think it, it adds a vibrant uh, excitement. Uh, you, you, can, you can just see at one of these events like this where the, the people are happy, they're out of their buildings, they get out of the office, out of their little cubicles. Uh, there's many different options of food, uh, including the brick and mortar restaurants. A lot of people really like that sort of outdoor dining al fresco experience and um, obviously that comes with a food cart or a food truck because you know there's not necessarily any sort of indoor seating or dining option but for the restaurants you know they have um, worked very hard to sort of create this outdoor seating area that's always a um, you know they're very specific rules about how to do that in Arlington and then when you had food trucks park there next to them and people queuing so all around the, t the um, uh, your existing uh, restaurant customer base or you had the noise of the engines um, either from the cart itself or from the, um, the their cooking methodology or music or things like that you started to see sort of an issue between the restaurants that have the bricks and mortar and the food trucks.
Tensions have risen about the up-and-coming food truck industry in Arlington. This mobile approach to food service has created a controversy between restaurants and food truck owners. It's just in your face direct competition, and it's mobile. So be mobile somewhere where you're not directly in competition with my business or the like, is, is what I feel. I think it's just like another restaurant opening up, so if they're worried about this, they should be worried about every single restaurant, which would kind of be ridiculous. If there was a coffee truck parked across the street from me, I'm sure that it would affect my business. It could go many ways. First of all, people could go to the, the coffee cart or truck and have a really bad cup of coffee, and that would just turn them on more to me. Um, so um, it de depends on the experience and to the quality of the food truck, I believe. In my opinion, I I've always thought that brick and mortar was the ultimate goal. Some people start catering out of their houses in their basement, some people rent space. But in my mind, ultimately, you want to have your own space. You want to be able to hopefully establish yourself as a neighborhood institution. And I think it also allows for you to grow, do a higher volume. Um, I would say that you have people that come throughout the day. So it's not just like for an hour you have folks show up and hang out, but throughout the day you have different people coming, so the place changes from morning to mid-morning to late afternoon. It's a totally different crowd, so it's kind of interesting to see who hangs out there. I've seen so many trucks, and like anything where something kind of multiplies exponentially in a short period of time, in my mind I've got to wonder, is this sustainable? Um, so I go back and forth. I think probably the higher quality ones the ones who uh, create a following will be around in a while. I would imagine, like anything else, some of them are going to fall by the wayside. I imagine they're here for a while. I mean, it's a great idea. Um, it's a great concept to be able to, to have food, um, good quality food in those trucks. Um, they had such a bad rep for so many years, and now they've really upped the ante by offering some really tasty bites. There's a lot more choices now. so. People don't have to wait anymore. You know, I've been there for so long that back in the day, there were hardly any choices. So you came to the restaurant and you waited because you wanted to eat and there were no other choices to go to um, if you chose not to have to wait the 45 minutes to the hour. I think the food trucks create more walking traffic, more excitement in the community, and uh, in turn, builds up more people in front of the restaurants, which they will also get more business. Restaurant owners believe that food trucks should abide by stricter regulations when it comes to location. However, food truck owners face some different challenges, some that restaurant owners are not aware of. One of our largest issues right now is there's a one hour on the street, a one hour serving time, uh, which is uh, not only a safety hazard, but it's a customer hazard too, because there uh, are customer issue. Um, is you have to pack up and leave when right in the middle of your lunch period. One of the other issues is it's a moving vehicle that is constantly in need of repair and, and uh, maintenance. And they don't really make kitchen equipment made to be bounced around in a truck. The biggest concern for restaurants is food trucks parking in front of their doors. Consistently, restaurant owners have stated that they support food trucks as long as they are not in an area taking away customers. I don't think they should be able to park illegally. I don't think they should be able to interfere with a brick and mortar business by taking up customer parking spaces, by obstructing the view of the storefront. So I think generally anything that would be considered um, obstructing a view or detrimental to the brick and mortar business. I just think that there needs to be a little bit of control over how many food trucks are parked in a certain area so that it doesn't um, hurt them, but I think that they could benefit one another definitely. Crystal City has been very successful in creating a solution to ease food truck tension. They have developed an alternative way for food trucks to sell food in Crystal City, but not disturb restaurant business. Our approach in that has been to tr create what we call Food Truck Thursdays, um, and we learned about this type of idea. I mean, certainly Food Truck Aroos are not new. 
I mean, it was Santa Monica sort of embraced this Tuesday night as food truck night. So we basically said, well, let's, you know, we have a really a big lunchtime crowd here because of our office tenants. Let's create a space for them so and a day for them. So Thursdays from this minute, from like 11 to 2, um, we have food truck Thursdays. And so there's a specific parking lot. It sort of eliminates the food truck issues around where to park and this tension between, you know, their, their um, customer base queuing around other restaurants that have outdoor seating. Mm -hmm. Um, and it really does away with any potential noise or other issues that um, might exist in that, in that scenario. And then the restaurants certainly benefit from it, as do the food trucks. So really in Crystal City, we've had about six to eight active food trucks, and six of those have been part and party to our food truck Thursdays. While tensions are high between food trucks and restaurant owners, a conclusion can be drawn that food trucks are here to stay. With further regulations, both brick and mortar and food truck owners can coexist peacefully. A couple of years ago, I thought they were a, fa a passing fad. Um, again, I think it I think the area will promote whether or not it's a fad. I think places that are highly uh, densely populated will um, allow them to prosper instead of becoming something that wanes and goes away. Um, if the people are making money in those trucks, they're going to keep it going, you know, it makes sense. It's, it's a good thing. I mean, bis all business is good, especially these days. I think they're here to stay. I just think it's a question of which ones will fall by the wayside and, you know, are kind of a fad. Uh, but I, I definitely think on uh, certain types are here to stay. I talked about it a few years ago, the possibility of opening up a food truck. Um, it's something I would consider because doing events and things like that, it would be very nice and convenient to be able to pull up a truck, park it, have the full operation ready to go. I think there's plenty of room for everyone.